fast steps. Step number one, let's go over Dr. Lacey Hunt's argument for deflation. No one researches this more thoroughly than Dr. Hunt and nobody articulates their position better in my opinion. As evidence of this, the most recent podcast with Grant Williams, Bill Fleckenstein, called The End Game, that featured an interview with Dr. Lacey Hunt. It is an absolute must watch. So a lot of this video is going to be summarizing and explaining what Dr. Lacey Hunt was talking about in that episode. As soon as this video gets done, make sure you go to iTunes or whatever your favorite podcast platform is and check out that episode of The End Game. All this will make a lot more sense and you'll be able to hear it in Dr. Lacey Hunt's own words. But let's start off by understanding just kind of the basics of deflation. We all know the story, so I'll go over it quickly. Basic economy, and you have all three of these individuals who own homes. They really couldn't afford them, but they're able to get all this excessive debt from the banking system. And because they have their homes, they go up in value. There's demand. We all know the story of 2008 or 2002 to 2008. So the increase of the asset prices due to the debt going up creates more spending, also more jobs for these construction workers over here. So the money goes from the bank, it goes to the individual, that goes to the construction worker, then the construction worker spends that money at the local store, as do these individuals who purchased homes by getting this loan from the bank. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is the debt, <laughs> I can't reach around, I'll have to go over here. Okay, so you can see the debt over here <laughs> gets really high. And then the income stays the same. So at a certain point, there isn't enough income to service the debt and it all comes crashing down. There's no more debt going from the bank to the homeowners. Therefore, there's no money going to the construction workers, no money going to the store owner. There's less spending, which equals lower prices, fewer jobs, and it creates this doom vortex. With the fewer jobs we have, the less spending, lower prices, it creates this feedback loop downward. So the Keynesian approach or the typical approach from the Fed or the people at the World Economic Forum, <laughs> Klaus and all of his buddies, they would say, well, we just need more debt because we have to increase spending. The problem is spending. Therefore, all we have to do is increase it. And if we could just take on some more debt from the government, or if we could just have these individuals take on more debt, problem solved. It's really kind of the knuckle dragger approach to solving the deflationary problem. Of course, Dr. Lacey Hunt is a genius, so he really gets down into the nuance of deflation and why just adding debt to increase more spending won't work. First, let's check out a report from McKinsey Global Institute. Dr. Hunt references continually throughout the interview that backs up a lot of his conclusions. Editor, let's go right to the internet. So we start on page 67 of the report where they go over historic episodes of deleveraging. Exhibit B shows us that they're not just measuring public sector debt, but also private sector debt and a combination of both. There's really only four ways out of this big debt problem. First, by belt tightening. And this is what happened in the majority of the countries that they studied during certain time periods. Basically, this is austerity. This is when you have to live beneath your means. You overspent, you overconsumed by taking on all this debt. Now it's time to pay the fiddler. You have to underconsume till you get back to an equilibrium point. And here they use the example of the United States in the Great Depression from 1933 to 1937 starting off at 258% debt to GDP. So this would include private and public sector debt. The next option is for high inflation. Of course, we know all the stories of hyperinflation and the devastation that does to the economy. But the upside is that it definitely does wipe out any debt you have denominated in the local currency. The third option, which is just as bad as an outright default, and the fourth is growing out of the debt. This is what all the Keynesians want us to do. This is their perfect world scenario. 
Unfortunately, it rarely happens. And let's look at the only time that it's happened in the McKinsey study. Three times, once in the United States, Egypt, Nigeria. I'd point out that in Egypt, their total debt to GDP started at 46% and really only went down to 40%. And that was after four years. So not that much of a deleveraging. And in Nigeria, it went from 15% down to 8%. And the United States is the only example of where it went down substantially. But I'd like to point out that was a result of World War II. So the options right now for the United States is to live beneath our means, produce more than we consume for a continued period of time, call it probably a decade, or we could opt for high levels of inflation that might even turn into hyperinflation, which would be far, far worse than just a belt tightening or austerity. Default really isn't an option for the United States, so the only thing left would be World War III. Obviously, the belt tightening is the best way out, although it'd still be very painful. But ironically, it's the one that all the central planners, the Fed and the government, are trying to avoid at all costs. The main takeaway is there's no magic pill. There isn't a benevolent super genius out there that if we could just find them and put them in charge of the Fed, or the government, they could figure out this creative solution that nobody's ever thought of that would allow us to get around having to take the medicine. It doesn't exist, it just won't work. Editor, let's go right to the clip of Dr. Lacey Hunt explaining this in his own words. The fact of the matter is, the, the debt is still effectively there, which means that you cannot bypass the law of diminishing returns. Because what you're thinking is that we, we somehow put it aside and then we go about borrowing more money to facilitate economic. Well, if you overuse a factor of production, the, the growth rate will just get weaker and weaker. It, there, there's no financial solution. Everybody's looking for a cutesy tootsy fix, <laughs> right. and it's not there. So this debt jubilee idea is... Uh, oh, by the way, I've heard people say to me, I, I've been told that you're a bright fellow. Well, if you're so bright, why can't you tell me what the fix is? <laughs> <laughs> there is no fix. Yeah. <laughs> but to understand Dr. Hunt's arguments even further in greater detail, let's go through a quick thought experiment. We've all heard this solution that's becoming very, very popular in the mainstream media, and we'll call it a solution <laughs> with air quotes. And it's pretty much looking at the balance sheet of the central bank and the government just like an NBA scoreboard. Let me explain. The government issues debt, we'll call them treasuries, and the Fed prints up money, that goes to the government, they take this money, they spend it into the economy. This creates GDP growth, but at a certain point, people start to worry, whether it's those politicians or those crazy Austrians that think debt is a big deal, of course this is their words, not mine, then we have a debt ceiling. So the government has to limit its spending. It can't spend as much as it was at the beginning that produced the original high levels of GDP growth. So it levels off, if not sometimes, goes down. So the people that look at this, they say, well, that is craziness. Obviously, we can see the more government spending we have, the higher GDP goes up. So if we have the central bank just take all of the liabilities of the government, so all of the treasuries, all of their debt, and just move it over to their balance sheet, since the central bank can take an infinite haircut and their balance sheet really doesn't matter, at a certain point when the Fed or the central bank owns all the government debt, we can just press a button and poof, the debt's gone. The asset side of the Fed goes to zero and the liability side of the government goes to zero. Then we can go right back on this trajectory of having GDP grow and grow and grow. It's absolutely infinite. The only thing we have to do is get out of our own way and realize the power of our own currency. You hear it all the time. We're not a currency user, 
We are a currency issuer, and that makes all the difference in the world. Again, their words, not mine. And when you look at it on the dry erase board and you think about it in the terms of a basketball game where you could just take the score from 100 for each team right back down to zero and start the game all over again, it kind of makes sense. But as you can imagine, there's a big problem with this way of thinking. The problem is it's really not about the debt or having to service the debt. It's what's been done to the economy as the debt was being produced, as the government was creating that spending. What they're not realizing is as GDP was going up as a result of all this additional debt, whether it's private sector debt or public sector debt, it's distorting the economy. It's misallocating resources and it's creating malinvestment. Let me give you an example. Let's look at Japan. They have all these zombie corporations that we've heard of. So even if you're able to eliminate all of the Japanese debt tomorrow, boom, it's gone, you still have all these zombie companies. It wouldn't really make that much of a difference. Also, let's look at Venezuela. They created their entire economy around one revenue stream. It was oil. This made their economy extremely fragile. So even if you were able to wipe out all their denominated debt, it doesn't mean that their economy is any less fragile moving forward. The damage has already been done. Let's look at the United States. Right now, the government is over 50% of the economy. In other words, government spending is responsible for over 50% of our GDP. So even if you were able to wipe out all $26 trillion of our on balance sheet debt, it still doesn't rearrange our entire economy. It's just as bad as it was before. And Dr. Hunt gives us the reasons why in economic terms. First is Schumpeter's creative destruction. Let's go back to Japan. If Japan or the United States back in 2008, 2009 would have let these big corporations fail, you would have had this creative destruction. So all of the good players, all the people who were prudent, all of the new young entrepreneurs with great ideas, they would have taken over the assets from all of those old monopolies. And as a result, our economy would be a lot stronger today than it would have been. Yes, we would have had to go through a year or two of pain, but we would be far better off today, not just in the United States, but Japan as well. Also, we have to look at the law of diminishing returns. This is vital. So to check out the definition, let's go right to Investopedia. The law of diminishing marginal returns is a theory in economics that predicts after some optimal level of capacity is reached, adding an additional factor of production will actually result in smaller increases in output. For example, a factory employs workers to manufacture its products and at some point the company operates at an optimal level. With other production factors consistent, adding additional workers beyond this optimal level will result in less efficient operations. It goes right back to the production function. We've all heard of land, labor, and capital. Those are the basics. So we have a black rectangle, we'll say that's land, blue rectangle, we'll say that's labor, red rectangle, capital. If they're all in harmony, running at capacity, we're producing 100% of our potential economic output. But if we layer on additional excessive capital, let's say in the form of government spending and debt, it will actually lower economic output. We go from 100% down to 75%. And then if we think the solution to a debt problem is just more debt, so the government spends even more, then economic output goes from 75% down to 50%. You see the problem here. 
What it really boils down to is there's only one way to produce economic growth. And we are all taught that way back when we were kids growing up. But no one articulates it as well as Dr. Hunt. So let's go to a clip from that recent podcast with Grant Williams and Bill Fleckenstein. What we have here, and really the thrust of, of where the modern monetary theory is going, what they're, the, uh, people are talking about the technicals of MMT, the, the real flaw is that what creates economic prosperity, well-being, advancement, is hard work, ingenuity, saving, reinvesting. The solution's not with the government. But you see, what we're looking for is some sort of easy governmental solution, which is not the, not the way we achieved our prosperity. That's the fundamental flaw.